Hello everybody, nice to see you folks. Um, welcome to this session, the uh, the second all-male panel of the whole conference and the only other all-male panel of the whole conference. We had one yesterday, which is also about advocacy. And this is going to be another one which is about advocacy. So uh, this is the place where people who might not be as obviously directly affected by issues affecting women and minorities uh, get to share some of the stuff that we try to do to try and make things better, strategies that we use and experiences we've gone through. Um, obviously, the benefit of women and minority groups within games and mar marginalized groups within games um, benefits all of us. So th negative things that happen to, the, to communities that we're not part of are also something that impacts our daily work life. So that's why we advocate. That's why we try to be better. That's why we try to make life better for everybody. Um, so. Hello, my name is Mata Haggis Burridge, uh, pronouns he, they. Um, I am a professor from Breda University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands, uh, where I do research about video games, uh, specifically the entertainment industry of video games and artistic use of video games. I've been a games developer for around 20 years now. I started off making Flash games around 2000 and ran a company doing that for seven years. Um, I then moved across to Electronic Arts where I worked on Burnout Paradise. After that, I went to Rebellion, where I became a lead campaign designer and writer for Aliens vs. Predator, and a few other things. Uh, since then, uh, I joined Brady University of Applied Sciences, which is a great place to learn about game dev, if you want to do that kind of thing, in the Netherlands. And um, over in Breda, I was the head of design and production for a while. Uh, and I still do freelance writing for video games companies uh, and do the research alongside it. Uh, so I still work with AAA. I've worked on most recently Resident Evil Resistance and uh, Dying Light 2 Stay Human. I've done some of the work in collaboration with Techland over in Poland. So uh, I do lots of research work, uh, some of it related to gender and race and representation, uh, but we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later on. That's a background of me. Uh, oh yeah, and I've been an advocate for equality for over 20 years now, 25 years, something like that. Uh, when my first Pride March in about 97, I think. Um, let's go clockwise as I see it. Tiago, hello, tell us about yourself. Hello, thank you for the invitation and I'm honored to, to share an all-star panel uh, here. So uh, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, gaming in, uh, went into my life like it was one of those pivotal uh, uh, happenings in, in one's life where my cousin uh, went to my to my house with a gadget that I connected to the to the TV and then I was hooked for life. I was five years old. The the, the machine was the Atari uh, and since then now I was a pro proliferal gamer. Um, so I, I've been a gamer all my life. Uh, I, I got the, the, the honor to witness the, the birth of competitive gaming. Uh, not uh, The esports world was not coined like in the late 90s. Uh, so I witnessed the, the, the birth of, of an industry. Uh, but when was the, it was the time to choose a career, a career path? I chose uh, uh, another one of my passions, which was journalism. So I did that for, for over 10 years. Uh, and then uh, after uh, like six or seven years uh, ago, I came back to, to eSports, now a full-grown industry, uh, where I set up the first uh, um, eSports agency in Portugal. Uh, and I was invited to, to, to work on Girl Gamer, the, the, the festival that celebrates women in gaming. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now, now we're back up here again to the modern day. Perfect. Mike, tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, thank you, Mata. And thanks again to everyone for you know having me here. I'm flattered to have the chance to be part of this panel. So I'm I'm Mike. I'm the, the CEO and a co-founder of a Boston, Massachusetts-based company called Modulate. And Modulate's mission statement is all about making social voice experiences, especially in sort of gaming and entertainment, safer, more inclusive, and more immersive for all possible players. 
Um, so we have two major solutions that we're, we work with game studios on implementing today. One is more on the player side, giving players more freedom to basically define their voice with technology that allows you to effectively sort of artificially swap out your vocal cords, um, whether that's to find an identity that's you know a better match for the character you're playing as online, just take more control over what you're sharing about yourself virtually, or help those with dysphoria find an identity that you know helps them express themselves a bit more authentically. Um, on the studio side, we're also building software to help you know, monitor the voice chat ecosystem for bad behavior and for harms done to folks, including you know, things ranging from hate speech and harassment to something uh, you know, really sinister and insidious like child grooming or radicalization, um, and you know, helping these studios to much more cost effectively and much more reliably monitor what's going on in these ecosystems without you know, stepping on player privacy, but actually make sure that they are going to notice when those harms occur. Sounds super important. Moderation of communities is massively, massively important there. Um, so obviously the, the focus of this panel is what can advocates do? What, what processes and what steps can we be involved with? How do we encourage other people to be advocates to support the rights of others who may not have the privileges that we have? Um, I've got a few different questions, a few different angles we can look at this from. Uh, but I think one of the ones that was uh, sort of actually something that Tiago kind of raised up there was this idea of gamer. Uh, Tiago said, I've, I've been a gamer all of my life. And I think one of the things that we try to do is, as advocates, is trying to make sure that, that phrase gamer um, includes lots of people. Oh yes, Charlie has just made a brilliant comment also in the in the in the chat there, which is if you do have questions for Q and A, please do put them into the Q and A tab, which is probably up there on your screens as well, uh, where you can ask these things. And after this uh, panel is done, we're going to be sent that some of those questions there. Or all of those questions there and we're going to be doing a follow-up article where we try and answer as many of your questions in as much depth as possible but yeah please leave them on there there will be uh, more content coming out based on what's discussed and the q a sections you have um but we'll do our best to cover lots of interesting topics right now um so yeah gamer identity this is something that uh, has been kind of almost a a battlefield it feels like um to use a quite hyper masculine term for conflict um you know it's it, it's it's something that uh has been fought over for, for for quite a while there um tiago obviously you've got involved in esports and promoting uh women and girls to get into esports so presume cis and transgender women and girls to get in there um can you tell, tell us a little bit about how you've made uh people who might feel pushed out of esports, included into the spaces that you've been working with, please? Well, uh, um, I, I truly believe uh, in engineering positive changes in the industry through advocacy and gaming. I, I think it's the perfect medium for it. Uh, and you can see it uh, uh, in the last years with games like The Last of Us or Horizon Dawn, where true changes are, are being made and uh, inclusivity is, is a, a, a main focus of, of the, the gamers. Um, in, in Girl Gamer, we, we want not only to guarantee um, a safe space to women to thrive, because that's the focus of our festival, uh, and showcase their talents, but also we want to integrate social and pedago uh, pedagogical... Pedagogical? Exactly. Uh, sorry. Values to raise awareness and increase levels of engagement with the communities in, in society. So mm -hmm. our roles as advocacy here is listening to the community, try to, to know what uh, what the, um, the, um, uh, the, the problems they face and really try to integrate anyone uh, mm -hmm. and uh, especially the, the minorities. Do you think that through creating that safe space, um, obviously one of the things when we create safe spaces is that some people talk about that as, as generating segregation. Um, I personally am in favor of safe spaces very much. I think they're a place to thrive. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about kind of the goals of creating a league which is separate from the main leagues, which are, are also inclusive of women, but always not typically friendly for women? We, we are all on for, for mixed tournaments. Uh, we, we always say that our purpose will end uh, uh, when 
uh, women and different genders will uh, have uh, will be accepted in mixed gender uh, tournaments. So we see this as a step stone to get to that to, to, to that level. Because uh, today we need we need uh, an event uh, like uh, like your younger to to happen. But uh, there's no reason for for any uh, uh, segregation between gender, sexes, races, and in, in gaming and in esports. Uh, so we feel that this is needed because there's a big problem, uh, especially with uh, with women uh, going into to esports, uh, where they face uh, several entry barriers uh, when they want to step up from gaming and be be the best player they they, they could be um, and then don't feel safe uh, I, I always I always uh, um, f fell back to to my own experience uh, I have I have a little daughter which is awesome and uh, rules at Fortnite uh, and um, uh, I, I, I educate my my children uh, without any uh, gender uh, boundaries uh, like she was like a big avengers fan for for a few years and she was always hulk uh, and it was really good uh, so we didn't have any kind of that type of uh, discrimination for for being a girl so it really shocked me when one day i found out that she muted her, uh, her microphone whenever she played with boys mm -hmm. so uh, i found out that this is an endemic and society problem uh, which need need the the work uh, of everyone for it to change. I know it's a generational uh, thing. It will take some time to 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 to, to change. But uh, with all, uh, it, it, it takes uh, the effort of all of us to to really make 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 the change at home, at school, and in society. Unfortunately, yeah. and and taking a, a bit of what Mike Mike said um, in in terms of um, communities like. Uh, gender or any kind of discrimination is unfortunately as I, as i said a society problem that creeps into gaming uh, if you add that to the anon anonymity that the internet provides and the age group that we are talking because they are all young kids right you have all the ingredients to create a very toxic environment that's why i i i, I need to to say to mike uh, that's a lot of good work that that you are doing and and we really need to 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 keep going in it. So I, I read like uh, an article uh, the other day that said that 65% of online gamers have experienced some kind of uh, form of severe harassment, mm -hmm. uh, and 53% of those players uh, believe they were targeted because of their race, ethni ethnicity, religion, gender, mm -hmm. sexual, uh, sexual orientation. So unfortunately, this is a much deeper problem that needs to be fixed at a societal level. And then we can can see it in the, in gaming because as I said at the beginning, I think that gaming is a perfect medium to really uh, uh, not have these kind of problems. Uh, yeah. But we all should do our part to to eliminate the problem. Yeah, I think it's interesting you talk about there about your daughter muting her mic. Um, yeah. So that comes across very much into what Mike's trying to do, really, in some ways. Um, Obviously, I, I, first, I, I think there's been a lot of research which shows that particularly people with gender dysphoria and um, transgender people have found that they can express themselves in a way that feels true to their inner selves through online play um, and can be much more empowering even, in, even within the same gender that they identify, well, that they were allocated at birth. It can be incredibly empowering. Um, how do you feel your, your, the, the, the technologies you have complement that and what do you think are the risks of the technologies when people could gender switch for example to disguise themselves as a man and then perhaps perpetuate problems absolutely i mean there's a there's a huge space of ways this technology could be misused and i won't go into you know hours of detail here in the interest of time but um anyone interested we've we've written a lot about kind of our our way of approaching these ethical problems and building this technology both the technical safeguards like a watermark that we build into the audio so you can identify that it is synthetic if needed um as well as you know the more kind of distribution safeguards around for instance, we just don't build voices that allow you to sound like a young kid. Too many ways that could go wrong. That's just not not an avenue that we go down. Mm -hmm. um, so we really have tried to do a lot of thinking about how can we make sure that we're we're providing this in a way that it's, as you said, Mada, I think the word is empowering people 
to you know reveal something more authentic about themselves go a step further and putting themselves out there in a way that they think is, is you know they, they see as real and as a real sort of fundamental piece of themselves um, and give them that control to choose how they want to engage in those online spaces and i do want to qualify that you know well i certainly think um and we've had a lot of folks from uh you know the lgbtq plus community um and folks with dysphoria who've reached out to talk about how powerful Powerful this technology can be for them. Um, it certainly isn't limited to, to folks in those communities who can get that kind of empowerment from these voice experiences online. Um, there have been studies that have shown, for instance, um, individuals who identify as cis women um, playing online first person shooters. Um, if I recall the stats correctly, I think it was 75% of those women had experienced harassment in their time playing those first person games, but 80% of the women said, I still want to play these games because that experience of being able to, you know, interface with people in a fundamentally different way, being able to socialize with people in this new context, that was also really empowering for me and made it well worth it. And I don't want to, you know, make a make a statement about trade off against harassment. We should get rid of all the harassment. <laughs> But I think it is really important to, you know, appreciate that even even in those times where people are having those negative experiences, there's a huge amount of depth that anyone can get from just having richer experiences in these sort of new platforms that we create with games. Yeah, I, know, I remember being on a, a panel, um, kind of closed door panel with Xbox um, about four or five years ago at, uh, at GDC, and it was uh, it was. LGBTQ panel, um, so there are many identities with uh, many different backgrounds. Um, and there were some very senior people from Xbox there, and one of them was just like, a, oh, it, it, it seems like you've all got some negative stories. I mean, how many of you have felt not comfortable in the online spaces? How many of you have received abuse in an online space? And every single person around the table put their hand up. And they were like, oh. We didn't expect, they, they just didn't expect that at the time. And I think there's become an increasing awareness in the last five years, particularly just how severe so much harassment has become. Yeah, the, the Anti-Defamation League, I think just a day or two ago, released their 2021 report about mm -hmm. harassment in online games. And I don't remember the exact statistic, but it was something in the high 80s of, you know, 85, 86% of all players have experienced some kind of material harassment when playing mm -hmm. online games. That's a horrific statistic. Mm -hmm. But what's kind of amazing is 99% of people report having meaningful positive experiences in those online games. Most surveys, you don't break 96 just because people fill out the wrong <laughs> bubble. 99%. You know, th there is something really powerful to that. And again, you know, we, we need to do something about that 86 or whatever percent. But I, I want to make sure that we really appreciate, you know, the, the power of having those online social platforms yeah. in the first place. And, you know, better construct those environments rather than saying that's a place that harm happens so let's all kind of flee from that environment entirely yeah definitely i mean i i, I used to run forums and we created a, a space there where it was incredibly diverse um like we actually did a survey at one point and two-thirds of the people on the forum identified as bisexual and it was never actually a forum which was explicitly about diversity it was just that people felt comfortable enough and safe there we created such a, a positive space that people went to it because of that um and so trying to there are so many useful things that could be done and you know empowering things that those friendships have lasted a lifetime um it's great um so the first yeah, the first words i actually heard on xbox live when i turned on halo multiplayer many 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 years ago uh was a homophobic slur um and that kind of shaped a little bit of my expectations of some of the online stuff i have had good online experiences but it's still a difficult place for anybody uh well for anybody actually to be honest so yeah. we'll talk and i think we, we should take notice of one thing because because the the normal default answer is like you just mute uh, your the, your mic or the headphones you shouldn't have to do that that's the answer like take action not ignore the problem, but see what the problem is and take action. Yeah, so 
obviously there are, we've got our own professional practices and things that we do um you know creating safe spaces creating ways that people can manifest um gender identities and different personalities and explore themselves within our own work how do well, do you folks do things that you would consider kind of wider culture, cultural actions, um, either in your workplace or outside of your workplace with how you communicate to others? I mean, obviously, you're on a panel here talking about this as well. Um, but what, what's, is, what do you do to try and change the culture, to try and shift things so that, for example, people don't encounter that online? Because setting up rules is one thing, but getting people to follow rules and be better. Mike, you look like you want to say something here. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, in some sense, this is literally the mission of my company, right? So I could talk about it all all day long, but I think- I'll you know, stop you at some point. <laughs> exactly. So ra rather than, you know, rehashing, so there there's the technology that we build, which obviously we think the, those kind of technical tools are really powerful for helping studios build an environment that does give players kind of the empowerment that they need to have the best experience while also you know not putting the responsibility on them to deal with bad actors it's the studio's responsibility to actually curate that environment right um i think some of the stuff going beyond that is you know we're spending a lot of time thinking at modulate about how can we how can we do better as an industry about communicating about where we actually are with respect to this toxicity and reports like the the adl report are really powerful but what i don't think that we have yet is a good understanding of in individual games what is the community like how how you know should you best be able to jump into these games and experience something new mm -hmm. right now you're relying on you know you jump into a reddit or a discord community and try and get a quick sense for yourself or you ask someone does this game have a bad reputation mm -hmm. but we don't really have the ability to publish statistics mm -hmm. and that kind of makes sense each game studio is worried if they publish stats and everyone else doesn't then those stats just make them look bad and but it's it's a it's a coordination problem and mm -hmm. one of the things that we're kind of excited about modulate sitting kind of in the middle of all that is if we're working with all of these studios and getting kind of that information that we can bring together and aggregate maybe that positions us in a better place to actually start being a little bit more transparent about what we are seeing there mm -hmm. um my my kind of ideal for that which i think is a long way off is something kind of similar to esrb ratings for online communities actually having an industry standard for you know if you have these kinds of safeguards and these kinds of statistics about how it's actually going then you can get you know an a rating for your online community being a place that's really safe for folks mm -hmm. and i think that'll be increasingly important um again not just for helping people understand you know which games are are going to be safer for them but getting the folks who to some degree have given up on a large category of games to see the progress that the industry is trying to go through yeah. and at a certain point the industry is going to need to be able to say hey we've actually we've actually changed you know something new has happened and convince those people to give it another shot and i want to i want to help the industry to be able to actually signal that really authentically as that work is getting done. Yeah, I think definitely uh, trying to, as, as the, the word that Emily had used in the, in the comments down there is, is transparency, trying to get data out there, trying to show what's try, attempting to be done by different companies is very, very important. Um, in your workplaces, uh, obviously we're an all male panel right here. Um, how do you try and go about making sure that your workplaces are safe for your employees and positive and welcoming for your employees and that they want to stay there? Uh, Tiago, you look like yeah, this. <laughs> um, my workplace is remote, but we work with, uh, with people all around the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we, um, what we try to do, I, I, I can I can talk a bit about uh, from from the point of view of a tournament operator. Like uh, you need to to get out of your own bubble and try to see the perspective of everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there there will be some cultural uh, differences between all the people. Uh, for example, uh, in our organization, we 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 work uh, with someone from Chile, uh, which is living in Korea. So this, this, these are all uh, two different cultures from, from my own culture, which is in Portugal, in Europe. Um, so we, we uh, always try to find a common, a common ground. 
uh, and really try to 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 be open to to to, to everyone. I think that's the that's the main the main focus that uh, that we should uh, take uh, in terms of accepting everyone uh, because uh, we tend to 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 uh, to, to live uh, in a tribal space, right? Uh, because we identify ourselves with the closest. Of, or, or not only of experiences, but our background and where we do, do we live. And only with some effort or personal effort to leave that bubble and try to understand the, the other the other person, then we can find a, a common ground where we can all understand each other. Uh, but it's all, it's person it's a personal thing, and sh we should all do that pers uh, should do that personal effort to, to reach it. Yeah. Out. And I, th I think we, you touch on something there which is quite important, which is about cultural differences. Um, you know, I've, I've given talks about patriarchy uh, in Eastern Europe uh, and that has its own risks. Um, Eastern European countries can be very patriarchal uh, and there are some people there who have very strong opinions about uh, queer communities. Um, there are some countries, some uh, countries in Eastern Europe where I would be in quite severe danger for saying some of the things that I say in other places. I was giving right. a guest a guest talk about um, women, minorities and queer rights, particularly in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, a few years ago. And that is not without its risks uh, in the current political climate of, of Brazil. However, there is also this thing that um, I feel like I've got immense privilege by being white and male presenting. Uh, that allows me probably a lot more safety than if I looked any other way. Um, and so that privilege I've got means that I have a responsibility to be a person saying those things because I'm safer saying it than somebody else. I also feel first like... Step. Sorry to interrupt you, but that's the first step to acknowledge it. Yeah, and, and I, think the, I think another aspect of this is that for all that there might be some people in the audience who are very angry about that, there'll be some people in the audience who've never felt validated or never felt like they've been represented by somebody standing up on a stage saying you're important you have rights you are welcome in this industry before so i think for those of us who have privilege there is also a responsibility to try and be a person who shows and encourages others to, others to feel valid and welcome um, because i think one of the things that we see in the games industry is that people join and then often leave within five years um, now, there's many reasons why that can happen, and that's across genders. Uh, all genders have, have similar, have, have high dropout rates. But we see particularly there's a lack of women in leadership roles. Now, that's part of that is historical, just due, due to experience. But I know some amazing women who really should be in leadership positions by this point in their career and haven't got there. And you kind of go, well, there's something else going on there. That's, 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 that's basically a boys' club a lot of the time operating. Um, so we really need to to try and heighten awareness among leadership, but also among general culture, that women are welcome. We want women to stay in the industry, because it's, it's all, all, all well and good talking about hiring policies, but if you've got no retention policy, if you've got no way of making women feel welcome in that place, um, if you're looking at, from, from, the, from the beginning of people's careers when they might feel less confident about themselves, we all feel less confident about ourselves, to the point of things like menopause, which are barely talked about among a lot of women, let alone among uh, multi-gender groups, you know, to make sure these facilities and these, there's, there's awareness here and support for all people in all stages of their lives to stay in the industry. Um, we need to be able to comfortably discuss these things and comfortably make changes even when those changes are uncomfortable for us. Um, Mike, tell us a little bit about how your company is set up and how you go about involving inclusion. Yeah, so I, I guess a really quick, you know, three-point list here. So the, the first, you know, risk to inclusivity is the people who genuinely aren't respectful, the people who genuinely don't care. Um, and it's easy to say, oh, we won't hire those people. And certainly, you know, that's something that Modulate says, but you have to live up to that. You have to actually find those people and really be able to screen for them effectively. So we talk a lot internally about what does it mean, um, the respect sort of pillar of our culture, how really do we think about that? How do we imbue that into our interview process? How do we exemplify the fact that we do care about this? And so uh, a part of our interview process is using our 
voice swapping technology to actually mask the age and gender of candidates during a phone screen. And this, you know, A, helps us avoid our own implicit bias, mm -hmm. but I think it serves an equally important purpose by showing candidates, you know, we're taking this seriously. We're actually taking steps to make sure that everyone is being respected in this community. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, saying some words on a website, but it's actually going out and trying to do something. I love the, the idea of using the voice modulation in interviews. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a it's been a really interesting you know way way to way to build upon the the culture there. Um, the second risk is something that I think Tiago alluded to before. You know, culture gaps. People who just might not realize that you know defaulting as as you mentioned before, Mada. You know, defaulting to the use of the term guys can be exclusive and there's a lot of people who really want to be inclusive but had never realized that before and so something really important especially for leaders that want to be advocates is acknowledging that fallibility and making that okay making sure that the right thing that happens is someone says guys and there's a good easy way to correct them and acknowledge like hey everyone makes mistakes it's okay we're not accusing you of trying to be exclusionary but you also need to be aware of this and setting up that culture where it's possible for people to you know both make those mistakes and still be you know respected but mm -hmm. also being able to actually you know improve themselves over time mm -hmm. um and then the final piece is you know ultimately recognizing the limits of your experience so Mada, you've called out this is an all-male panel um myself and my co-founder we're both white cis men um and we're doing our best to build up a, a team that's really widely representative of all the great diversity out there in the world but we're still a small startup there's definitely going to be you know gaps in the folks that we're able to bring in and the experiences that we can represent um so you know bringing in outside advisors or we've set up a variety of you know lunches where we bring in other folks from the industry that can represent different perspectives and help folks on our team see you know a different lens on what leadership looks like and have these different experiences and have different potential mentors, that's really important too. You can't do it all internally, at least until you get to the size of company that you really do have true representation. And that's something that I think very few organizations actually manage to achieve. Mm -hmm. I think it sounds great. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's nice way to do it. I think one of the things which is very importantly highlighted there is something which i feel that intersectional feminism has done better the, the kind of the previous three waves of feminism which is to admit that uh we're all kind of feminists in progress um and that uh we are fallible and we are even with the best intentions going to sometimes cause harm and sometimes that then the degrees of harm hopefully will be very minimal because we're trying our best but equally i think um people misphrasing, misspeaking, um, like the, we had the, um, one of the policy uh, people from DG Connect, which is a huge EU uh, funding group, which really does a lot of good work in researching gender. Yesterday on the, on the call was, was kind of going, so the two genders, and uh, I just put in the comments, it's like there's one, two genders. And she, and she immediately was back in the, in the comments going, yeah, sorry, I misspoke. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And it's, it, sometimes it, well, that's what it needs because you've got to understand that you know intentions may be good but actions don't always match and then it's about ensuring that when we do kind of the the, the call out a little bit that it is done with uh respect to severity character behavior and things like that. So i think this is super difficult because call outs have also been incredibly essential in for, for example people like uh, harvey weinstein's example like a very extreme example there where so many people knew and nobody nobody to call out on this um where that was absolutely 100 percent the right thing and well overdue for happening whereas we've seen kind of very um extreme examples where people have almost this this whole idea of cancel culture which is a complex one because cancel culture doesn't seem to really exist against because you know you see these people i've been cancelled they say on the the national newspaper front page and you're like hmm, that doesn't seem to really work that way but the call outs I think are important and as you say I think trying to do that with respect and understanding that a person may have um, not understood for example the implication of their words or just misspoken they may have understood but you know habits and um, 
I, I literally went around to my colleagues, I think this was about four or five years ago now, and I was, actually I remember the first time I said it was at a conference, and I said, if I say, hey guys, on this stage, I want people to be holding up their hands immediately and <laughs> tell me to say folks or everyone or you all or anything else. Um, and I think actually by, by, being, by standing up and doing that so publicly, I really gave myself a feeling of like, it's okay to fuck up and I welcome people trying to correct me and I would do my best to take that with humility because we all get defensive when someone confronts us. We all get defensive. It's a natural instinct, but I think we, if we prepare ourselves mentally that we are gonna fuck up, that I think it's very useful that we can then also go, and then I'm gonna try and be better. Yeah, I, th I think you used the correct word there, uh, to be humble. I think it's it's very important because uh, we can do better and we should do better uh, when uh, we're, when confronted uh, with uh, with other realities, right? So we need to be humble, take it on a positive uh, positive uh, spin, and do better. Yeah. yeah. If I can add a, a really quick, you know, on the ground story here, one of the things that we've done to try and encourage this is built a. a very simple little Slack bot that just notices certain terms um, that might be exclusive and will just, you know, call, call out, hey, maybe you meant to say X, Y, or Z. And, you know, this is, A, I think been, been helpful for our team, but it's also funny because it's a, it's a very simple keyword matching thing. And so at one point, someone on the team was posting something about Fall Guys and Slackbot had some recommendations, and so there, there's now an internal, you know, running joke about the game Fall Folks. That's going to be, you know, a great new experience. But it's actually been a, a very nice little, like, very low key, low, low energy way to just kind of make sure that that's pervasive through the culture. A continued awareness of we're all trying. We all might make yeah. mistakes sometimes, but we're always trying to move in the right direction. Yeah, I think so. And I think there's there's so much in the foundations of, of feminism, which is of great value that um, we need to build on these ideas. But we also understand that there is some stuff from feminism which has been incredibly toxic, like some of the early uh, voting rights things were actually incredibly racist. There were things like uh, don't let a black man get a vote before a white woman. Yeah, uh, that kind of stuff has no place in modern feminism, in my opinion. That kind of stuff can go fuck itself. Um, so so I, I think that we really need to understand that, you know, people in the past may have had good, good efforts, but there are also other things that we can do better. And I think we're always learning. And there may be phrases that I think are, are brilliant phrases now and brilliant terms now, which in a few years' time, I might kind of go, oh, yeah, I, I see where I was going with that. Uh, no, no, good intentions, but it didn't quite get there. Um, yeah, so Micah has just pop popped into the thread there, uh, intersectionality, absolutely. I mean, um, the intersections of race, class, geography, uh, gender, age, ableism, neurodiversity, and many, many more things. There are so many different ways in which these things overlap on each other and create complexities and create multiplication of problems. Um, so, um we talked a little bit about kind of what we do inside of our uh groups when we when we're talking to the outside um tiago you, you obviously you do a lot of publicity for um girl gamers um what what sort of responses do you get and how do you cope how do you um try to change a, a dialogue when it's going in a negative way <laughs> well, uh, what I'm saying. yeah uh, first be humble because uh, uh, advocacy as a white male only gets you uh, so far, right? Because mm -hmm. when you get to the, to, to the point that you did your job, you need to step out of the way. So mm -hmm. we are always learning. Uh, so uh, we need to be humble, hear the, the other part, and just um, um, be better when we have to be, to be better. Uh, and, and since we do run um, uh, uh, no female event, uh, it, it, it's already second wedding, but for a good cause. Uh, actually, the, the, the actual world, girl, a girl gamer, we, think we, we took on a, a, a word that has a, a, some negativity about it, girl gamer, and we try to, to give it a positive spin, uh, uh, empower the world, to 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 show that uh, you you don't have to 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 hide uh, to to show what you can do and what you want to do. Uh, so what what we do in terms of community management 
uh, which is a field, uh, a Mike's field, uh, we always try to to see the other side, uh, mm. of course, uh, and, and always with the perspective that we don't know it all, uh, and we are always learning and always absorbing and uh, better our process. Yeah. Um... There's just been a quick comment from uh, Angelo down there, which I think is a very valid one, a very important one to recognize, which is when somebody, for, for example, ourselves, it's, it, it's entirely possible that sometimes we're gonna get called out on saying something wrong. Um, and then just how incredibly emotionally tiring it can be for the other person to kind of go, I know you're doing a lot of good stuff and I know you're generally right, but this time you're not. Um, I think the defensiveness that people feel in that situation is, I, I both understand why people are defensive in that situation. I think it's very, um, it's very nice to, I think it's something as, as advocates we need to reflect on how we go about encouraging others like ourselves who are trying our best to not get defensive in that. Um, have you got any thoughts on that, Mike? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think this kind of goes back to, to the idea of, you know, fallibility being okay within the culture. And this is a place that, you know, someone like myself, who is privileged as a, as a white cis man, can I think do, do something really effective here, where if I'm going out and showing, hey, I just made them this mistake, and it doesn't you know, ruin my, my image of myself. It doesn't ruin my status within my community. What would ruin it is not getting better. And, you know, mm. me, me going forward and acknowledging, hey, yeah, I have made this error. And what I try to do is when, when folks, you know, I've had folks from, from the team occasionally pull me aside and say, hey, you, you just gave an all hands meeting and used this terminology. And you might not have realized, but that read to me kind of negatively. And what I'll always try and do is post something for the full team after that and acknowledge like hey i just learned this really valuable lesson i'm so excited mm -hmm. to now have this information make it make it a positive thing within the community mm -hmm. so that i think the reason people get so defensive is they're conceptualizing themselves as i'm a good person yeah and they're being told you failed to be a good person you're now a bad person yeah and if instead it can be hey i know you're a good person and i want to help you you know, be, be even better. I want to work with you because I know that you're good, because I know I can trust you to want to help. Mm. Then it's no longer something that they need to get defensive about. Yeah. And I think, I think we, we've got to be careful about placing the, the, the emotional weight for um, tiptoeing around fragile egos. Um, I mean, obviously, t typically we're talking about men making mistakes here, but it's also been commented on the, on the, that women in other genders also make mistakes. I, mean, I, I remember years ago when I started teaching about feminism within my games education at, at Breda, um, one of the there was a, there was a kind of hot topic video going around by a, um, a person on YouTube who claimed. I'm a feminist, and this is why these deeply capitalist, very entrenched patriarchal systems are in women's best interests. And lots of people send me this and go, Mata, what do you think about this thing? Because everything she says sort of makes sense. And I was like, aha. Uh -huh. now, now I'm put in, in a position where I'm going to be kind of the white male presenting person who has to stand up there in front of a large group of people and go, this woman who claims to be a feminist is actually really shitty at feminism. Um, and that was uncomfortable. I mean, the way I personally approached that was by going, right, groundworks of what I believe feminism is and what I believe feminism should be and the change that feminism is asking for in society. We're looking for equity. We're not looking for matriarchy. We are understanding that this is a systemic thing, that there may be people who are enforcing patriarchal systems which are unfair without intentionally enforcing patriarchal systems that are, that are unfair. And so with that in mind, let's go through what this person's saying here in the arguments and the, the rooting of where this is coming from and actually be able to unpick it, looking at the intellectual structure of what was being said without kind of going, yeah, but she's wrong. <laughs> it's just like, I get where she's coming from. Here's why I don't actually believe that this, the label she has used for herself here as feminist actually fits with what I think of as feminism. And she has a right to believe that she's a feminist in her own perspective. I've got a right to disagree with that. Um, that's super tricky, particularly as a person who is not the uh, group which is most problematically affected by patriarchy, although I think men are also mentally negatively affected by patriarchy. 
it's uh, yeah, similar as Joe has mentioned, there, similar flaw to to white white fragility, this sense of like a fragile masculinity. I could think we could talk about this all day, but I think we need to start getting to wrapping up things here. Tiago, was there something you wanted to jump in with there? No, no, I, I, I was just saying that um, one, uh, I personally think that uh, most of the times we forget that uh, we are different and we need to, uh, we, um, we have different requirements or different needs. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have the same uh, accessibility to to the things that we want. Uh, I think that's the the main the main issue here. Uh, and sometimes maybe we forget uh, when when we talk about feminism and and see and uh, always spin the conversation into no they have they want to have things their way. Um, and not it's not it's not that uh, we just need uh, we are just uh, uh, focusing on on equality, which should be uh, the same for for everyone, right? Uh, in every area, in every aspect. Uh, mm. I, think, I think that's it. Yeah, moving on from also going beyond equality into equity, so everybody gets what they need, um, not just not just equal, but to to their needs, it suits them. It's, of course, uh, that, that's the yeah. main point. Yeah, yeah, because we are not uh, we we, all, we are not the same. We are not uh, equal in terms of uh, women and men. Talking about uh, only these two genders, right? Um, we are not we are not the same, so we need to own it and mm. assure that we have equality, yeah. even even so. Uh, Mike, any sort of thoughts that we can move towards wrapping up with? Uh, any messages you want to send? Yeah, I I mean, Mata, when we when we spoke earlier, you kind of brought up the the potential question of you know what shouldn't advocates do, and I guess mm. to to speak a, a little bit on that side. Um, there, there's a sense in which I think it's important to say, you know, advocates shouldn't necessarily treat advocacy as something special and new. Advocacy is really, in, in a fundamental sense, two things that should be very pervasive. It's consci conscientiousness, being aware of what you're doing and how it impacts the people around you. And to Tiago's point, empathy, actually having real understanding of the people around you, not just modeling them as clones of you with a different haircut, not ignoring them entirely, but saying, hey, you you have your own, you know, rich internal world, and I need to be able to understand that. And if you have those two things, then advocacy becomes a matter of, you know, just applying those in practice and learning a little bit more maybe about some of the consequences along those particular dimensions. Mm -hmm. If you don't have those two things and you try and jump straight to advocacy, then you're following some prescribed set of rules that maybe helps a little bit in narrow cases, but you're mm -hmm. not like th these are nuanced topics and you're not going to be able to write down four simple rules that all you know white cis men should follow to now make the world better it's it it is going to be you know everyone that we're trying to support everyone that we're trying to be advocates for each of them is different too they all have their own needs they all have their own expectations about how we can be supportive of them you can't capture it all in these simple rules and so i think that's that's my biggest point is you know we've talked about a lot of examples of things that can help but make sure that you really are thinking about the the specifics of the situation that you're in the individuals that you're working with mm -hmm. and to a point you made earlier mata you know you're not putting it on those individuals to have to educate you but you are putting it on yourself every time just as you would in any other situation you know to get to know the people around you and to treat them with respect along all dimensions of who they are yeah thank you um i think for the final point from me then uh would be that I think I've seen so much difference in, in how feminism is shaped and presents itself in the last 20 years. And I think we, with intersectional feminism or just intersectionality, as some people now call it, um, I think we've actually got to somewhere which is much better at creating empathy because it's not just about here's one kind of axis of a person's individuality, but it's much more three-dimensional model or well, much more pan-dimensional model of who people are and beginning to understand how everybody's coming from a different place. Um, another tiny thing is, is that I find it really interesting that uh, different languages have better or worse capacities for, for doing some of these things, such as there is no non-binary singular pronoun in Dutch. Uh, in, in English, we can say they, they did this. They walked down the street by themselves. 
uh, and that makes perfect grammatical sense. Whereas in Dutch, you can't do that. There is no there is no word to say non to use non-binary pronouns. But, so I think it's very interesting to see that just also language is its own bias in itself, um, and it's it's very very challenging. Apparently, also in German as well. Uh, there's one last thing which I was going to add, which is uh, within academia and policies. I'm trying to do some work to look at how systemic biases are embedded in these things. I'm doing a study at the moment, which is looking at the front covers of 1,000 video games from the last decade. Uh, and I'm uh, trying to encode all of the gender presentations and racial presentations within the characters on the front cover. I'm seeing super interesting stuff coming out of the data and I hope to publish it someday. Um, but one of the things that's very interesting, 2009, about 12% of the people on the front cover of a video game was a woman or, or female presenting. And in 2019, it's around 30%. And it is mostly steady growth. And there was a big surge in 2015 at the same time as there was a massive assault going on in indie games towards women and queer folk and people of color. So it's nice to see that the games industry saw all of that stuff and seemed to have leapt up and actually improved. It's still only 30% compared to the others, but we are getting better. The world is improving. Um, and I think if we all try and keep working together with understanding, empathy in our hearts, um, trying to collaborate and share what's best and respectfully trying to improve each other's behavior along the way when we can, um, I think we are hopefully going in a good direction. Thank you so much to Women and Games for inviting uh, Mike, Tiago, and myself here today. Um, we really appreciate that you wanted to have um, people who are not women on stage as well. I think that's um, very kind of you to do that, and we really, really appreciate the honor that you've given us for allowing us to be here. I hope you all found that interesting. If you have any questions that we haven't addressed or anything like that, please pop them in the Q&A. They'll be forwarded to us. We'll address that as best I can. Uh, Tiago, Mike, thank you very much for being awesome panelists with me here today, and um, thank you, folks. Have a brilliant rest of the conference. Enjoy the rest of the talks today. I'm going to be popping up occasionally. Thank you. Thank you, all, folks. Bye-bye.